In this particular video, we're going to talk about general mechanisms, how hormones do what they do, and then we'll be breaking out into specific glands to talk about each of them in more detail. So I'm going to start with just giving you a reminder about uh, different gland types that we have. We've seen this earlier in the semester, um, back in chapter one. Um, so with glands, there are two different types, exocrine and endocrine. And exocrine glands, let me just get my laser pointer here, exocrine glands, like on the left, uh, exocrine glands have a duct that leads to some sort of a surface. Um, so these can secrete out, out of the gland directly. Endocrine glands, what we're going to be talking about in this chapter, endocrine glands are more like what's shown on the right. Um, so there is no duct leading out to the surface. Instead, what happens is this gland produces hormones and those hormones diffuse um, through the tissues and they get taken up, taken up by the bloodstream um, via a capillary. So endocrine glands, the hormones are staying inside essentially and they're just being transported through the blood. So um, when we use the word hormones, what do we mean by a hormone? A hormone is just a regulatory molecule and it's generally transported by the blood. So there are uh, several specific glands throughout the body that produce hormones and we'll be looking at the major, major glands um, for all of the hormones that are produced. Keep in mind that um, each one has a specific target cell that it's going to act on. And the specificity of hormones just comes down to what sort of receptors can it bind to. So there are a lot of similarities with neurotransmitters in that sense. So uh, what do hormones do? They do a lot of very important things in the body, but some general functions are to regulate metabolism. Hormones control how our cells are able to take up glucose or, or not take up glucose. Um, so energy metabolism. They also influence growth, growth of tissues and growth of organisms as a whole, um, and they also allow reproduction. So again, major organs that are involved in hormone production are shown in, in the diagram here, um, but keep in mind that even organs that are not listed as major endocrine glands, um, many other organs also produce hormones just in smaller amounts. So we're just going to be focused on the major ones in this chapter. And... Um, to tie back in with, with the nervous system, what we've just come from in the course, you remember that we said the hypothalamus can produce some hormones and they're stored in the pituitary gland. We're gonna be seeing that in more detail today. Um, but hormones that are produced by nerve cells are called neurohormones. And um, with that in mind, let's start by sort of comparing and contrasting. There are gonna be a lot of similarities in this chapter with hormones, a lot of similarities back with neurotransmitters. So some of the things that they have in common, they're both very specific. They bind to specific receptors and that allows them to, to target particular cells in terms of the actions that they cause. Um, and always the receptor binding, that's the thing that initiates some sort of a change or some sort of a signaling cascade to take place inside of the target cell. With neurotransmitters and hormones, um, they both have to have a means of being deactivated. And oftentimes that will involve either taking back up the molecule or um, inactivating it, maybe cleaving it in half. So there are mechanisms in place to turn off the signal that's being sent. And then finally, um, keep in mind that some of the molecules we've already seen as neurotransmitters, some of those are gonna show up again and they're gonna be acting as hormones. A good example of this is norepinephrine. So we've seen this um, as a neurotransmitter, but now in this chapter, we're going to be seeing it acting as a hormone. So sometimes the same molecule can be used in two different ways in the body. Hormones can be classified a couple of different ways. We can classify them based on their chemical structure. And based on that classification, there are four major categories. Amines, we've seen these again before. These were uh, neurotransmitters in the last couple of chapters we've been through. Um, amines are just derived from amino acids, tyrosine and tryptophan specifically. Polypeptides and proteins, these are larger molecules. So this consists of multiple amino acids connected together. Again, we've seen examples of this as well. Uh, Antidiuretic hormone, we've mentioned that in the past. Um, we'll be seeing growth hormone and insulin in this chapter in more detail. 
and then glycoproteins. Um, so glycoproteins, if you'll recall, this is a protein with a carbohydrate attached to it. Glycoproteins, um, a good example of a glycoprotein that is a hormone is, um, well, there are a couple listed on the slide, but any of the gonadotropic hormones that, that we'll be going over are glycoproteins. And then finally on the list, we've got steroids. And um, steroids have that distinctive ring structure. Um, this was one of a, a type of lipid that we saw back when we were talking about different types of chemical molecules. So we can classify based on chemical structure. We could alternatively classify hormones based on their action, how they do what they do. Um, so looking at, looking at it this way around, there are some hormones that can cross the plasma membrane and there are others that cannot cross the plasma membrane. And that's a big difference, being able to cross that membrane or not, um, that leads to different different approaches in terms of how the hormone does what it does. So if we're talking about polar hormones, so big polar molecules, these generally cannot cross through the plasma membrane, right, because it's lipid. And so this means um, that these hormones have to bind on the cell surface. So the receptor for the hormone is on the plasma membrane, it's on the cell surface, and receptor binding then initiates some sort of a cascade of events inside of the cell. Um, okay, the nonpolar hormones, these are often called lipophilic. They like to be with lipids. And um, these are the types of hormones that can just diffuse directly through the plasma membrane. They're able to cross. And this means that their receptors, they don't have to be on the outside of the cell. They can actually be internal. They can be inside of the cell. And a lot of times these hormones end up influencing activities in the nucleus. They influence uh, gene transcription almost directly, but we'll see that in a little bit. Um, so two very different means um, of action for hormones. In either case, regardless of which category we're talking about, when the hormone makes it to its target cell, there can be a couple of different ways the cell will respond. So it depends on um, how much hormone is present, how much is binding to receptors in the target cell, and it also depends on the combination of hormones. And um, with regards to different combinations of hormones, you know, sometimes there can be multiple hormones that will act together to result in sort of the same consequence. A good example of this is epinephrine and norepinephrine. Both of these act to increase the heart rate. So that would be an example of a synergistic effect, a synergistic interaction between two hormones. Alternatively, we could have hormones that have opposing effects. And a good example of that that we have mentioned already in the class earlier um, is insulin and glucagon. These have opposite effects in terms of uh, blood glucose levels. So insulin, what insulin does is it promotes cells to take up glucose, and so that lowers the glucose concentration inside of the blood, whereas glucagon does just the opposite. It ends up promoting the breakdown of glycogen into glucose, and so that raises the blood glucose levels in the body.